Well, this is the Drew Spirience episode two. I don't have any guests planned for today. I'm only going to be doing most likely two interviews a month, and then I might do two episodes or one episode where I give my two cents on the current state of uh, MMA, whether it's UFC, mainly UFC, since uh, that's what we all follow, and what ha what's happened after a pay-per-view or what has happened after a fight night, if anything really stands out, or if big news happens. This past weekend was the pay-per-view of November, UFC 255, featuring both the men's and women's flyweight titles on the line, where champions uh, Davis and God of War Figueredo fought Alex Perez in the main event, and Valentina Bullet Shevchenko fought uh, Jennifer Maya, top three women's flyweight contender for the women's flyweight. The card itself was pretty decent. On paper, though, it looked pretty bland and boring considering when you think of November, that's a month where the UFC likes to load up for Madison Square Garden's card. Whether it was the UFC 244 last year of the BMF title with Masvidal Diaz and amongst other fan-friendly fights, uh, favorite fights such as Thompson Luque, Till Gastelum, amongst other fights, it was such a deep card for a November card. Uh, the UFC's other card, which was 217 back in November 2017, GSP's return versus Michael the Count Bisping, and Cody Garbrandt versus TJ Dillashaw, followed with uh, Rose Nama Yunus versus Joanna Janjacek. Oh, what a crazy card that was. But I think the best Madison Square Garden card has to arguably have been UFC 205, McGregor Alvarez, Thompson Woodley, and Janjacek versus Kalakowicz. That card itself will go down as one of the most important cards in MMA history. The reason being is because the UFC and mixed martial arts had finally been legalized by the New York State Athletic Commission to have mixed martial arts in Madison Square Garden, arguably one of the meccas of combat sports. When you think of Ali versus Frazier, amongst other big events, I just think the way the UFC has gone into MSG in New York has made an expectation that that November MSG card has to be stacked always. However, due to the pandemic of this year with coronavirus, New York is unable to hold any events. So the UFC had to improvise by going back to Las Vegas at the UFC Apex to hold its fight nights and pay-per-views until further notice. Or they also go to Fight Island during uh, parts of the year for fight nights and big pay-per-view cards, as we saw with the Khabib Gaethje style bender versus Paulo Costa and before that Usman versus Masvidal in July looking at this card I'm going to rate it as a good eight on ten there were some very interesting prospect fights on there some journeymen too that you know no not journeymen but fighters you know who've been on the roster for quite a while that may have had their shots at championships and are just but are just trying to keep their careers alive any way they can. Kudos to them for that. So I'm going to start with uh, the fights I saw. And uh, the fights that I saw was, I'm not going in any particular order. This is what I thought was interesting. So I'm going to start with the first fight, which was Antonina Lapantera Shevchenko, also Valentina's older sister, who fought Ariane, Queen of Violence Lipsky, the former KSW women's flyweight champion, who's uh, made an impressive run in the UFC so far since she came over in January of 2019. Antonina really shocked a lot of people with how good her grappling can be. Because when we think of La Pantera, especially Antonina, she's known as a very fluid Muay Thai counter striker who, uh, is also, who also likes going for the knockout when need be. And when we've watched her grapple, we've seen there are some blind spots that do need improvement. However, you cannot take away the fact that she does have a judo background for grappling as her sister does. And we didn't really see that, but we saw more wrestling. And Antonina just came in guns blazing. So did Ariane. Credit to them both. They, they, were, they're both, they were both spectacular. And Ariane did give, Valent did give Antonina a few problems at times, which really made the fight interesting. However, Antonina used her height and her reach to her advantage to take down Ariane and just give vicious ground and pound. It was really 
impressive to watch considering Antonina had lost her last fight to a grappler of a Caitlin Chukugian's caliber. And that made people wonder, is she really a good mixed martial artist or is she primarily just a striker that will do good against below average grapplers? And Ariane Lipsky is no below average grappler. She's a former champion and one of Europe's top promotions. She's a legitimate practitioner in BJJ, even though being a, known more as a striker herself. And this was just a great fight overall. And Antonina proved that she belongs up there with the number, I would say, 7 to 15 ranked women's flyweights. A title shot is possible for her. However, the only thing that I think that works against her is her age. She's now 36 years old. It's, the window starts closing once you hit 35, but we have seen it, exceptions to the rule in mixed martial arts. And I would say it is possible. I think a title shot is in range. I'm going to make a bold prediction. Well, not a prediction, but a, I would say that if she can go on a run and she demonstrate the game plan she had versus Lipsky on Saturday, she can win another three to four fights. Yeah, I'd say three to four. I personally believe that Antonina could challenge for the title. Will that be against her sister? No. I believe that Valentina wants to get a rematch with Nunez because in the second match they had back in 2017, Valentina competed as a bantamweight since flyweight did not exist. And I have a feeling Valentina, who believes her sister is capable of winning a title, eventually will go up, vacate the title when she's had enough title wins to really go for that ultimate prize in the rematch versus Amanda Nunez, arguably the goat of women's MMA now. Another are, and that's what I love about women's flyweight. It's just so open. I'll get more too into it, into women's flyweight along the way, but the other fights that were on the card were pretty impressive too. I was pretty impressed with the uh, Yaquan Numansa Buckley versus Jordan Wright. And Jordan Wright is a pretty good prospect coming out of Jackson's MMA, having mentors to look to, such as Holly Holm, Johnny Bones Jones, Greg Jackson, Mike Winklejohn, Carlos Condit, to name a few, just to, to really develop his game after being uh, awarded a contract on Dana and White's Contender Series. Yoquan Buckley, uh, to talk about him, we don't. I don't really think I need to give him much of an introduction, but he was arguably known for having arguably the greatest highlight spinning back kick in mixed martial arts history. Well, one of the greatest knockouts and kicks ever seen since he did it in midair like a ninja and became an internet sensation. The pressure was mounting. Can he repeat? Can Buckley have a repeat performance? And it was just a moment because we can easily fetish, fet, we can easily have fetishes or fall in love with these fighters who have these amazing knockouts, but then it only proves to be a one, they only prove to be a one hit wonder, not being able to take that to a next, the next level with their, uh, the other tools they possess in their martial arts arsenal. Jordan Wright was no easy opponent. Buckley surprisingly proved that he's a knockout artist and he is show, showing very fast that the, his rise to stardom can be quick. The only thing that's holding him back is middleweight has a lot of contenders that are unranked and prospects that deserve to be in the top 15. And there are still a lot of gatekeepers that are kind of on their way out or they are hoping for that last, that last title shot at 185, which is holding your, your, uh, which is holding Buckley. I'll just say Buckley. It's easier to say, to say his last name. It's uh, holding back Buckley from entering that top 15. So if we have a few retirements or a few roster cuts, no doubt. I think if Buckley wins another two fights, since he's now gone 2-0, and since that uh, with this win and his last highlight real win, Buckley could be a very formidable top 15 185-er. And he, I believe the next match for him will be the grudge match against James Krause. He refused to say his name in the interview. So I formally believe that the next fight will be that on a fight night or maybe they'll add it on a pay-per-view card just to help get it more noticed and then that way Buckley can maybe get a higher pace Buckley and Krause can get higher pays maybe a few of those golden pay-per-view points but it is it is exciting and it's crazy to see like how the sport can make stars within a moment and how they can build upon them and I'm going to hold my 
high praise for Buckley. I still want to see a bit more. I want to see how he adapts versus a good wrestler. It's the classic case of strike, striker versus grappler. How will he do versus a very good jujitsu practitioner? Let's see how he does. And if he can pass the test with at least two more wins and crack the top 15, I think he should follow the path of uh, Jeff Neal, who's in the welterweight division, one of our arguably one of the dark horses with very hard KO power. So let's see how that happens with Buckley. It's very exciting. You can't fault the man. The man has a regular day job at Walgreens, as he's mentioned. He didn't quit his job full time because he has benefits. He has a family to feed. He's got bills to pay. So credit to got to a man as like Buckley. He's trying to balance two careers at once while trying to better his circumstances. Can't hate that. You have to love it. And I love seeing when uh, good comes to people. There's enough success to go around for everybody. So I really hope to see another two wins and then eventually gets into that, that ranking to increase his pay and all good things from there. The next fight was that I paid attention to was uh, Paul Berju Craig versus Mauricio Shogun Hua. You look at this fight, it's, uh, it was a rematch from about a year ago where Paul Craig and Mauricio and the Shogun ended up in a draw. And this time around, Paul Craig came out on top and made Shogun submit to ground and pound and strikes, which is unheard of considering Shogun is one of the biggest bulldog battlers in the yard. It's kind of sad because, and I'll say why it's sad, and I'll say why it's sad because when you think of Shogun, if you're a hardcore MMA fan, you think back to the Pride days of the Pride 2003 to 2005 Grand Prix where he was coming in just starching everybody, knocking them out, showing aggressive soccer wheel-like kicks. Go on YouTube, do yourself a favor. I want anyone who watches this video after watching or listening to the audio version of the show, go on, you, go on YouTube, subscribe to Fight Pass, and look up old Pride videos of Mauricio Shogun Hua and how wild he was in his fights versus Ra Quentin Rampage Jackson. Uh, uh, Sir uh, Cyril... I believe it's Cyril Diabate, Cyril Diabate, amongst others. And as Dana White said, he looked like a former shell. Shogun looked like a former shell of himself, and he'd like to see him retire. And I think it's time for a new wave of, of mixed martial artists to come in. Because from the Pride days, we only have left Alistair Overeem and... Shogun, but Shogun could be on the way out after because when Dana says he wants to see a guy retire, he's going to try to find a way to make sure they don't fight again for the better of their health. Whether you hate him or love him, I think Dana's doing the right thing because Shogun's 39, he's been in a lot of wars, and it's just a matter of how much mileage you've accumulated from all the damage taken in those wars. And as I said on my last podcast with Adam, my good friend Adam from Unanimous Decision, when we got the Pride merger, we did not get the Stone Cold Killers that were we saw on TV overseas back in the day before the merger. And a lot of these guys came with like, uh, like broken down with injuries, not to take anything away. Shogun still won the UFC light heavyweight champion, which says something that he still had juice in the tank. He never defended it and he, due to injuries. And then history, as the story goes, lost to a young and up and coming Johnny Bones Jones, who became the youngest UFC light heavyweight champion in history. And Shogun, after that, was in some very inter entertaining fights. The one thing with Shogun is I'll always enjoy watching Shogun perform because he has that wild Muay Thai and that wild striking gung ho. Look at his fight versus Dan Henderson at UFC 139 on November 19, 2011 arguably one of the best fights in mixed martial arts history that's in the UFC Hall of Fame. And he had a few other fights. He almost got another shot at the title, but Alex Gustafson derailed that in December of 2012. And then Gus famously went on to fight John in arguably the greatest light heavyweight title fight history where John looked human and had to go into his inner champion to really dig out that win to show what champions are made of. And, and, what I and if you want to watch that fight too, I'm sure it's on YouTube. I'm sure it's on Fight Pass if you subscribe. John said, he said that he didn't train properly for that fight. And that just goes to show how talented John is as a champion with that fight IQ and that experience. And overall, 
And overall, it was just really, really impressive to uh, see what John does, which I'll, I, I, I'll talk about John Jones when I give my two cents on the, on my own or when I have guests on that. No, I like talking about John Jones, but let's go back to Shogun. And I just think to preserve the legacy of these pride fighters, if they're on their way out, I think they should leave on a good note because Overeem is the last one left who's on one last title run. And honestly, it's, it's kind of sad to see what's going on. And, uh, and, then, and, then also, and then also what makes, what makes this uh, era coming to an end kind of sad is when you think of Pride, look at all the wars. Like when Pride was a counterpart to the UFC, Everyone was like, oh, my God, when are they coming over? When will they come compete with the best of the best in, our, in ours? They kind of did that. Um, I'll probably give, do an episode, a bonus episode on Pride and the rivalry they had with the UFC. But for now, let's focus here. Like everyone was hoping to see what Shogun would do if he came over. And then the merger had a bit of a slow start, but then won the title versus Machida and just butchered Machida in both fights. Machida won the first one and a very controversial decision, which I even thought Shogun won. And then Shogun just proved it. And I just, and as mentioned, he's got a family. He's probably made lots of money and I hope he's been good with it as a lot of these fighters have when they, in, with, with good investments and other projects to set them up for success post-fighting. But if we're going to remember the Pride era, the Pride guys, the Pride FC guys, as one of the, as one of the of some of the greatest additions to mixed martial arts, they should retire on a high note. Because if not, we're just gonna everyone, whether they're casual or even some hardcore, will say, you know what? It's just a part of a bygone era when MMA was still evolving. And yes, you can say that. But I really believe in history. Pride did play a, in, a very a very important role in growing the sport of mixed martial arts. And I just really hope that this is the, if Shogun retires, he makes good decisions for his, himself and his family. And the pride, the legacy of pride remains intact, even post UFC. You want to keep it going as a good memory for nostalgia when you want to watch wars. And as for Paul Craig, credit to him, you know, prospect that was hovering around that 13 to 15 ranked range shows that he can stand in the UFC 205 division. And beating a legend like Shogun is a nice, is a very nice addition to the record. So kudos to him. And hopefully with what he showed on Saturday as a grappler and with some great striking over that he's improved over time, he can rise up in the rankings. The next fight on the card was, that I also watched was, was Mike Platinum Perry versus Tim Dirty Bird Means. And... I was expecting a lot of it. However, the fight, like the way this fight was scheduled and what happened was just was like the Twilight Zone. Originally, Perry was supposed to fight Robbie Ruthless Lawler, former welterweight champion in the UFC and former middleweight in Elite XC. And Robbie pulled out for personal reasons. And he's another one that is on the way out. And it's just sad to see because when you think of when I think of ruthless Robbie Lawler, he was the reason why I got into mixed martial arts to begin with that UFC 189 with Conor McGregor, and then also John Jones. Even though John was suspended at the time for out of the cage antics, these were the three guys that really got me into MMA actually. And Robbie is also on the way out, having a losing streak since his uh, losing the title to Woodley and. You know, it would have been nice to see this fight because I really believe Robbie could have won. But he's got other things going. So they brought in Tim Dirty Bird Means, another interesting welterweight who was supposed to be considered, uh, he was considered a top prospect. He could have rose up in the rankings. However, due to, an, to a suspension with USADA for, an, for a tainted supplement, which then turned out he was innocent, thank God was uh, has kind of had his career career not derailed but prolonged to try to get into those rankings but still great guy a lot of potential nasty striker and a battler too like perry 
Perry showed up missing weight, and that's enough. That's one red flag. And then during the fight, didn't really look that good until the end when he started fighting out of desperation to put on a brawl. And when I look at Mike Perry, I just think that he shouldn't be fighting right now. They need to get him some counsel for his mental health based on some of his outside the cage behaviors. And they need to get him into a camp where the coaches can really help him develop some great habits for training, prepping for fights, and showing up ready. Because I've said it before, Mike Perry is a poor man's Chuck Liddell with proper training. He's got that knockout power. He's got gorilla strength. He's got a, a crazy chin. And it's just a shame that, you know, he's got so much potential and it's not being utilized as we like to see. So I'm hoping that he takes some time off and whatnot. So now we move on to the co-main event and Valentina Shevchenko. Wow. She's just proving how dominant she is versus Jennifer Maya, who was a legit black belt in BJJ. What really impressed me about, uh, what really impressed me about this fight was Valentina showed that that she, that she bit her, that she bit her lip, put the workman's performance in. It wasn't her best, but she showed, she looked human when Jennifer Maya took her down and then came out of it and did what champions do. I'm pretty convinced Valentina had a conversation with John Jones back at UFC 247 when they fought on the same card because Valentina has that John Jones GSP IQ where she knows what to do by fighting her opponents at their game and proving that she can do it better than they can. She's just so dominant, and she proved it again. Now, she is suffering what I believe is a bit of that John Jones, not suffering, but she's experiencing that John Jones, Demetrius Johnson experience, where she's so dominant that no one else can stand with her in her division, unless it's Amanda Nunes, who's only beaten her by a very close decision and margin. I think Valentina also reminds me of a female GSP. A lot of people say, whoa, why would you compare her to a George St. Pierre? I'll tell you why, and I'm going to stand on this. They're both very similar in how they carry themselves. They live by Budo, the true martial artist way. Very humble, very polite, courteous. They do all the right things outside the cage. Secondly, they both have traditional martial arts backgrounds. George St. Pierre comes from a Kyokushin karate background. Valentina comes from a Taekwondo background, and they're both high-level ranked dance. The difference is Valentina took her Taekwondo into Muay Thai to learn the art of eight limbs where her striking has become so lethal because a lot of Taekwondo practitioners end up succeeding in Muay Thai because they learn the fundamentals of elbows, the clinch, and punching, whereas Taekwondo doesn't really have a punching base. They do, but it's pretty subpar where you're focusing more on kicks. As mentioned, she looked great, and I just see great things for her. And another thing how they're also similar is they both have grappling backgrounds. That's very underrated. George became one of the best wrestlers in, MM, in MMA, also has a black belt in BJJ. Valentina has a black belt in judo. And we saw Saturday how good her grappling has become as she wanted to change up what she's normally known for. Super impressed. I believe that the flyweight division for the women's is really open. There's a lot of potential and a lot of fights to make. I just believe her next opponent, that's Jessica Andras, she'll have an easy time with because Andraj is that typical style that's tailored for Valentina. Push forward, Valentina counter strikes, takes apart. Who knows? But I just see, think Valentina's fight IQ is miles ahead of everyone else in her division since women's flyweight is still new and developing after, as since being incorporated in 2017. We move on to the main event next, which is the main event between Davison Figueredo and and Alex Perez, a Dana White contender series uh, prospect. I was very impressed with, uh, what's, with what's happening with, uh, with, with, with what's happening with Figueredo because he's proving that he is the man to build around for flyweight. I was never really into flyweight until Demetrius left. And even then, I don't really pay attention to the little guys. But what's really impressive about – what's really impressive about uh, – I'm just plugging in my thing here because my laptop's about to die. So don't mind me. Okay, so what's really impressive about Figueredo is how powerful he is. He is such a small guy, but has the power, the punching power of a middleweight and welt or welterweight, we can say. And Perez looked very good, but he looked very good. 
but sorry guys he looked very good but Figueredo found a way to submit him and Figueredo is a legitimate black belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu so that just goes to show what Figueredo is made of god of war he's known as and how badass is this he took another title fight on 21 days notice since UFC 256 the annual end of year December card dropped two title fights from uh, the card and Figueredo said no problem I just really hope for Davison to succeed as a champion being from Brazil and not speaking much English he does pick up the language I'd really like to see him improve um, because as my former guest Andre Benke said the reason why stars like Anderson Silva and Vitor the Phenom Belfort became so marketable was because they spoke English to the masses. So Davison, just look at the way he looks. Looks like a, like a badass with that blonde hair. You can get behind his story, you know, struggling to get to where he is and to becoming a feather uh, flyweight champion. He is just on another level right now. And I really hope they build around him. This is showing that the flyweights can succeed, the, especially in the men, which they've had so much trouble building up because DJ had no opponents, then Cejudo came in, but Cejudo didn't really defend, did not really defend the flyweight belt. He vacated it to fight a bantamweight. So I'm really happy to see that the div division is taking a life of its own and only better things to come from here. I, it's just unfortunate that Cody no love Garbrandt, who was originally scheduled to fight Davison had to pull out due to getting COVID and then injuries after experiencing COVID. So I wish him a speedy recovery and I really hope they make that fight down the line. But for now, let's let the division build itself. Let's let the contenders make a name for themselves versus this guy. Cause God of war Figueredo as he's nicknamed, he's just so fun to watch. He's just so, it's just so in, entertaining to watch how hard he hits, how he dominated a long time contender in Joseph Benavidez and the first time he missed weight, Figueredo, so he was ineligible to fight. But the second time, made the weight and showed that he is a legitimate. Through he was a legitimate contender to becoming a champion. So kudos to him. Love how Walid Ishmael is being like a heel translator. It makes it more entertaining. And honestly, I'm just excited for what the future of flyweight men and women hold. I really think it's experiencing a new renaissance. There's more eyes on it. And the trick is to put it on pay-per-view. Do not make it for free because people won't really give a shit, as uh, Adam my from Unanimous Decision said. And I think he's right. Put it on pay-per-view, it will sell if you put it up with another big title fight and other fights on the card to build around it. So as mentioned, this is the video version, which will be available on YouTube. The audio version of my podcast, The Drew Experience, is available on Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts, Breaker, amongst other audio platforms. Please subscribe, whether it's to the YouTube channel or vi on video or audio. I really appreciate everything that everyone's done to take time to listen. I'm only getting better. I learn from everybody. I have another guest coming on soon. I'm not going to say who, but I will admit that this is something I like doing where I like having guests and then giving my two cents on the state of MMA because. Sometimes I share the same opinion as my guests, but I want to give my own unbiased opinion. Might be a bit biased though, so I stand corrected. But nonetheless, I welcome all I welcome all the trains of thought to hear what people, whether whether he or she thinks this or that, and so forth. So once again, stay safe, everybody. Enjoy the rest of 2020, and I'm excited for the next one. Thanks, guys.